Catonic. Saw that I'm a pastor, that's pretty neat. I was wondering if you or the people in the church in general ascribe to the idea that most of the scriptures are more symbolical in nature as opposed to literal. As in we're all sons of God, meaning we're all God, for example. That is a good question. It's on that. But we had a we had a theological question. So let me I've got a little thing here. I, I like to highlight things so everyone knows what we're talking about. Hopefully you don't mind. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that up there. So here's the question, and, and there are people of, on both sides of these sorts of discussions, these both sides of these sorts of debates. Uh, our church is 100% unapologetically on the side that the Bible is literal. It's It was written as a literal book. It was believed by all of the early church as a literal book. The idea that it's all symbolic and to be interpreted as however the individual sees fit is a pretty recent idea, a, a idea that then has no um consistency um ripe for contradiction uh and and basically has has no firm ground uh as a result because everybody's going to interpret it differently based on how they feel at that time uh the only way to be consistent and i'm big on this is not my word it's uh, god's word and so my role is to find out what he says, not for me to make up something that sounds really good. And so the only way for me to be consistent in interpreting that is if I take it as liberal. That's the only way to be a consistent, we call it a hermeneutic. It's your theological approach to reading. Is, is or to reading, to study, to and then to preaching it, to presenting it. So uh, to have a consistent hermeneutic, the only way to, is to be literal. It's not that that's the only way that people are. It, that's my approach on it. It's because I, I want, my goal is to not to come up with something that uh, makes me feel good, makes me feel happy. I, I want to know what the God of the universe has to say to us and then share that with others. And so the only way to be consistent with that is that. Yeah, the synoptic gospels mean that one gospel is written from, uh, from the others. Good, here's a good here's a good discussion. Yes, which always made me uncomfortable. And so you can't agree that it's literal. Can we talk about that for a second? Um, I would love this is this is great. This is good conversation. I'm going to throw that up there too. So we have a term. There, most of you are going to be aware if you're even just passingly aware of the Bible. I'll I'll, I'll queue up a game, but no promises that it'll be good. Um. In the Bible, most of you might be aware, passingly or not, that there are four Gospels. The Gospel simply means good news, and it is the story of Jesus specifically, as opposed to the rest of the Bible, which is kind of the history arc of the people of Israel, and then the church in the New Testament. Um, the Gospel is the transition from Israel to the church, and that is Jesus. He arrives, and he offers salvation to Israel. They put him on a cross, and then he goes out to all the world and says, hey, I will... Uh, offer myself as a substitute for you. So there were four Gospels written, three of them at relatively this close to the same time in history because they're, the people are going in all different directions. The, the, the disciples are going all around the ancient world and there are different audiences with different questions about who this guy Jesus is. So for example, Matthew, writes, even though we have all four, we read all four, um, Matthew writes with the purpose of um, talking to Jewish people who already know what the Bible has to say about the Messiah. And so their questions are, how can we prove this guy is the Messiah? How do we know that this guy is who he claims to be? Um, does he fulfill the prophecies? How does he be? Who, what is his lineage? Is he uh, from the lineage of the uh, the king of Israel, David? Which the prophecies say that the Messiah will come from David's line. And so they've got a lot of big questions. So Matthew starts off right away with the genealogies. A lot of us skip that. This is very important, though, because... If it doesn't have those genealogies, we don't know that the guy is legit. We don't know that he really could be the Messiah. And so right off the bat, it's like here's he has all the credentials. And so it goes down the list. So Matthew's talking to the Jewish audience who know what they're looking for, and he answers the questions. Mark is primarily written to Roman slaves, 
people who are stuck in in the in society with no hope with with no time with no freedom of luxury and so a lot or even just the, the common man you had a very very big difference society like not everyone is slaves like chain shackle you've got people who are simply uh the middle class is non-existent so so your your life's work is to be a servant in someone else's house and that sort of thing you might be educated but that's your that's your job at life. and so um mark he knows his audience they're they're first of all they're most likely not jewish um and they're they don't have time for details about prophecy so mark does not have a genealogy mark does not have all those details about who this guy is because they don't know the old testament to know what they're looking for they just know need to know that there's a guy offering to save you now not one that you've been waiting for because you weren't you weren't waiting for each of the synoptic gospels were written close together in time but to a different audience luke is written as a as a uh, a student he's an edu he's a, a doctor he writes to a, a roman official uh, and so he's writing to the, the upper class, and so he's including a lot of details that the educated man might look for. Um, all those are really interesting. Then you come to, and here's the question, the question is, well, there's four, but only three were written back to back. The fourth one came a lot later. Why is that one different, and is that okay? And, and what's, what Monkey's here saying is, it, it, that's not comfortable to say that that's okay, because it's so different right it's not just different in timing it's different in content and so and so that's the question let me see if i can make this to where i don't get myself killed i don't know why i got the i'm gonna save that i'm gonna save that okay so here's the deal john was john is the one the odd one out the odd ball out okay john is the the book that was written around 90 a.d jesus lives around 30 around 30 uh the three gospels are written in the in the 50s 60s john is written 80 90 a.d 30 years after the rest and its content is so very different it's it's focused more on what you might say like theology rather than history um and so then there's a lot of questions about this why does it stand apart why are there things that sound like they happen in a different order that sort of thing here's the answer in that time, those 30 years, you now have the beginning of the church. Church starts in, in 40 AD, roughly. We're just using round numbers. Roughly 40 AD, you now have 50 years have passed. John is an old man. He was the youngest disciple. He's the only one who was not martyred. He lives in exile uh, by the Roman government. They, they don't want him around doing his thing, but he's still writing. And so he's writing uh, to the church. And in those 50 years since the beginning of the church and the, and the first generation of apostles have all died except for him, we're now the second generation Christians, something has started to happen. There was a heresy that started to come into the church, uh, several in fact, but, but one of those heresies would be something like Gnosticism, that sort of thing. Um, but you'd have these ideas that Greek philosophy teaches that uh, the physical, the body, the, 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 the things you can touch, those are evil, but the spiritual is good. So you've got that sort of thing. And then you've got other philosophies going on that are saying, well, Jesus might not have been God at all. He might have been um, just, a, just a good preacher, just a good... Just a good prophet okay so you got all sorts of on the spectrum of all sorts of these false teachings that are creeping into the church so john writes his gospel and he deals specifically with the 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 heresy of whether or not jesus was god so the church is beginning to doubt the church is like i don't know i know that i know that the, you know there's this but we read in these other like philosophies that that really they you know nobody could be it's both spiritual and, and, uh, and physical at the same time. And so it's dealing with this question, could Jesus be God? That is why at the very beginning of the book of John, it starts out so different. There's not a genealogy. There's not a history. It's not a lineage of the birth. Instead, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we beheld his glory, and it dwelt among men. And, and he's saying, look, 
the Spirit of God became human and became a person. His name is Jesus, and, he, and, and I got to be a personal witness of him. And so the answer to the question, why is it different? It's asking, a, it's answering a totally different question. Earlier, the question was, is this man good enough to be the Messiah? Because they all agreed that he had something going for him, but could he match the lineage, right? Could he be the son of David, all those things? So that was answering those questions. The question changed. Now the question is, we know he's a man. We don't know if he's God. And so the answer to in John is yes. He is, in fact, God, and so that's the purpose of that. That's why it stands apart. Also, because it was written 30 years later, John knows what content they do and don't have access to. Okay, so, so he knows that they have the other three Gospels. Why rewrite... Oops. Uh, why rewrite all of the... Um, the same content if they already have it three times. Earlier they were sending it out three different ways. Now they've consolidated and they have all three. Why rewrite the same thing? Instead, he what he writes are, are filling in the gaps that the other ones don't have included. He's, he's the last eyewitness. He knows what was included and not included. He wants to give them uh, the last bit of information he can. And so that's why John is different. There is no problem with John being in agreement with the rest of the Bible. There are some questions that people come up with uh, with timing and chronology. And it, give me enough time, and, and we can actually 100% answer every one of them. There's actually no contradiction at all between any of them. But there is a difference in purpose. And because that difference in purpose is why they sound so different. Because they were written for a different goal. Answering different questions. And, and so I hope that answers the question. But uh, that's, that's the main reason. You're absolutely right, they're different. But rather than us saying, well, I guess we just don't believe anything the Bible has to say, we actually need to say, I guess I was reading it wrong. It was written for a different reason. I hope that all answered it and it and makes more sense. Good. And, and feel free to follow with any more questions. No problem. Uh, Cartoonic had a question a long time ago asking about if I think the literal interpretation is true for the first scriptures. You mean the Old Testament? Yes. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people have different opinions, but the only way, as I said, the only way for it to stay consistent, the only way for it to stay, uh, accurate, the only way to trust it as God's word instead of, oh, this has been reinterpreted and we played the telephone game and it's been changed over the generations. The only way to know, to have a, a way to view it, to say, this is in fact something I can base my life off of, is say the whole thing is consistently literal as, as written. Literal is a poor word. Because then we go and say, okay, well, if it's literal and everything's literal, Jesus has a quote. He says, I am the door. Okay, so was he made of wood? Does he have hinges? Does he have a door? No. Like, like, how, how, like is, he, is it literal? Obviously not. But it uses metaphor just like the rest of us. But it's written as history. It's written as a literal document of, of real events. And, and so to take it any other way would be disingenuous. All right, all right. Salt Monkey, yeah, I encourage you, check it, like, check it out again with that different perspective, that these books have different goals in writing. Each one had a different audience in mind, and so it is actually uh, answering the questions that the various audiences had. We tend to look at the whole thing as one giant novel. It's, they're actually all separate books consolidated into one library of books, is the Bible. They're all in agreement. They're all, they're all consistent with each other. But they do have different um, reasons for being. There, here's another question: Was the, was the Old Testament also the Word of God? I always thought that there was ageless stories that had been told over long periods of time. Yes, that's a very common perspective. Actually, there was a, there was a question right before that. Hold on, hold on. I got baby just Yeah, but I'm going to turn the camera off just in case he wants to visit here. But we can still talk. Um, what's that? I'm scrolling up. Who delivered Jesus? Sleevelessness. Uh, can you elaborate? I'm not sure what you mean by who delivered Jesus. Do you mean Mary, as in when he was born? So, Katonic asks... 
Sorry, you got a singing a singing baby Drewski to to accompany our discussion. Oh. What did I do? I'm, I'm... There we go. Okay. Was the Old Testament also the, the Word of God? And so, as I as I already said, uh, my position is yes. There is a very popular number of views that are are variants of the idea of it being folk tales, legends that are passed on and eventually written down. That's a very popular view. Okay. Even among Christians, very popular view. The reason for the existence of that view is generally not because there's some fault with the writings. There's nothing within the writings that says this can't be originally written by the authors who claim to be writing it. There's nothing in there that, that insists on that position. The reason why people come up with that position is because they don't like the implications that it's actually written to be literal. The creation account is the prime example of that. But it goes on, you know, the flood and, and the Tower of Babel and a lot of the just major miracles that happen, the crossing of the Red Sea. So many things that happen in the Old Testament that people are like, oh, that's too much. It's too fantastical to believe. Well, if you're dealing with the God of the universe who created all this stuff, it's really not. But that's usually the motivation. It's not because the text doesn't work, doesn't fit. It's because we don't like what we find. Uh, is usually the reason for that. Um. All right. So so. Yeah, over long periods of time. And then usually cu coupled along with that idea that it is uh, too fantastical. I don't want to sound like a robot to saying hi there again. Um, coupled along with, along with that is this um, idea that because it's been a long time and because they had to hand copy these, that maybe the copies of the Bible we have are not accurate anymore that they're that they are there's there's errors there's there's mistranslations and all the, and all sorts of er issues there can i tell you like that is actually cannot be farther from the truth um some of you have been here for a while yeah word of mouth so so playing the telephone game you know the telephone game right like you sit in a circle um somebody tells whispers in the ear of the person next to them some line that then gets whispered in the next person, the next person, and all the way around, you go around 20 different people. When it finally gets back to the original, we all have a good laugh over how very different the message is from the beginning, and we just assume that happens all the time. The thing is, the Bible has been demonstrated to be, as far as accuracy, we're talking transmitting the information. You might not believe with the content. That's, that's you know, everyone can decide their own on the... The, uh, the truth of the content, they might disagree. But what every everyone does agree on is that it is actually the single most accurate book in all of human history. Accurate ancient document in all of human history. And you say, wow, that's a big, that's a big claim. Uh, it's actually verifiable. You can, you can, you can check the numbers yourself. I, let me. So. Here, I can, I can come back. So, um, I don't know if you guys want me to go into all the details on it. I've done it before, but basically when we're comparing manuscripts, when we're comparing um, how many copies of an ancient document, any ancient document, we actually use the same rules for all ancient documents in, in you know, archaeology and all that. If, if When we're comparing these things, uh, we have a, set, a certain number of rules, and one of the biggest ones is, well, just how many manuscripts have we found? No, we don't have any originals. But if you're looking at, say, like, Plato, Aristotle, Caesar, like there's, a, there's a whole bunch of ancient authors with ancient books that have written things that we now have. We use it in our philosophy classes, in our history classes, and we teach them in college, and we, and we have no doubt that this is the, the ones that are written. What they don't teach you is that we have barely a handful of copies of these manuscripts, and none of them agree with each other. We have no idea what they originally wrote. I am giant specialist, and uh, and and can I can I follow that up with some some proof? Because I think that would be appreciated if I if I do. I generally that's an appreciated thing. So so give me a second. Okay, there we go. 
I'm gonna pull up a, a PDF over the screen here. There we go. There it is. Okay. This is, I think this is fascinating. I love this stuff. What you have here... I'm gonna zoom in so hopefully you guys can read this. This is as of a couple years ago. This is not, like, to the date. So, you know, if something has changed in the last year or two, it's possible. Uh, the Iliad is the most um, well attested ancient document outside of the Bible in human history. We have 1,757 copies of the Iliad. Okay, that's a lot. That's a whole lot. That's more than any of the other ones. You can actually see the list goes only down from there. This is the most to the least. Now, if you're if you're able to read that list, I don't know if you can or not, and I'm, and I'm trying to multitask, so I'm not really looking too close to the moment, too. Um... But if you are able to, to, to read that list, what you'll see is that it was written in 900 BC, and the oldest of our 1757 copies was only found in 400 BC. There's a time gap of 500 years. So there's your 500 year time gap. Okay. So there's the statistics for the Iliad written by Homer. Odyssey, we have, we have less uh, copies of that, that sort of thing. I'm going to add in more. Is that a shields up? Did I forget something? Thank you. I don't even know where to put it. All right, so so you have this. So you got that. But it goes downhill from there. And by the way, it's 500 years from the original. That's a lot of telephone game. Now I can hopefully talk for a minute. And what we find is that no two manuscripts agree with each other. They're, they all have significant differences, sometimes whole paragraphs that vary from, from manuscript to manuscript. That's a problem. So which one do you believe? Which manuscript is accurate? Then you get further down. Demosthenes, Caesar, Plato, Pliny the Elder, Sophocles. We have all of these. And you'll notice we only have 300. Some of the bigger ones, Aristotle, you might have heard of him. We only have 50 of his work, copies of his manuscripts of, the, of all of his works total. And yet, in your philosophy class, never once did your teacher say, now, we're going to talk about Aristotle, but we don't actually know if anything we're going to teach you is something he actually said at all, because there's a lot of telephone game being played. Right? We only have 50 total, and the oldest, he wrote that in 384 to 3, his life, 384 to 322 BC. The oldest one we have is from 1100 AD. It's a 1400 year gap. Can you guys see this? Hopefully you can. A 1400 year gap from when Aristotle wrote his works to the ones we have in hand. And we only have 50 copies of the thing. How do we have any idea that what you're being taught in your philosophy school is as anything at all like what Aristotle wrote? We don't. But we can trust it because this is the best we have. Right? And, and it goes on. You can read the whole chart. I'm going to jump to the Bible. Here you go. Greek New Testament. This is a translation. We have 6,000 copies of the translation of the New Testament. Oldest, 125 AD. Uh, no, it's not a translation. It, it's, it's the New Testament. Old Testament is in Hebrew. So we have 6,000 in Greek. And then as it got translated to other languages, we got 18,000. And they're only the range from 25 to 50 years off the original. What that tells us, that means that those are within the same generation of the authors. We have manuscripts, we don't have the originals. We have manuscripts that existed at the same time as the guy who wrote the thing, or the people who witnessed the events. And so that manuscript, had it been false, they could have just ripped it up. And we've got 20,000 of them. 40,000 copies of the various scrolls and, and bits and pieces of like, you know, of, of, of paragraphs here from a, a long uh, disintegrating scroll. We've got 42,000 of the Old Testament. And we can talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls, how we found them. They're a thousand years apart. We actually know that with the telephone game, the Dead Sea Scrolls are actually uh, extremely accurate. Um, sorry, multitasking is not my my forte in general.
So the Dead Sea Scrolls, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls were the oldest by about a thousand years from what we have. The like King James was the King James Bible, and all that was written. And we had no, uh, we, the oldest Old Testament we had was like 900 AD. Then we find the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's 100 BC. And and what we found is in that thousand year time gap with all of the telephone game, the thing never changed. It's all but identical, except for the way that spelling works. Just like we don't spell things the same in English today as we used to back then. It is the most accurate translation in all of human history. Does that mean you must believe its contents? No. No, I do, but it doesn't mean you have to. But it does mean that any scholar worth of salt does not question that the contents is accurate to what they was originally written. So there's no telephone game. Right? So, so that's important because now the debate goes down to just what does it say, not just whether or not we have what was originally written. We do. The, um, what now the question is, do we believe what we're, re what we're reading? I hope that all makes sense. Yeah, it is, it is the most, the highest accuracy in all of, in all of human history. In all of antiquity, we have more copies and, and closer to the original than anything else in all of human history. It's amazing. Um, was it a miracle? Yeah, the, according to the Bible, it was a miracle. And and I am inclined to believe it. Uh, again, we just talked about how it's accurately transmitted from one copy to the next copy. It's accurately transmitted, but it's up to the individual to decide whether they believe the contents. I believe the contents. So yeah, it, it, the Bible says that, uh, that Jesus was miraculously conceived, and we celebrated his birthday yesterday. Whether or not that was the actual day, that's another good conversation, right? Um, it doesn't matter. What matters is that that is another well-attested historical fact. Jesus was a real man who lived. Okay, that's one of those other things that is not debated in in uh, scholars' in circles. What is debated is whether or not he is who he claimed to be, right? So we know that there was a man named, named of course, there's a lot of people named Jesus at the time. Jesus was really the name Joshua. Joshua was the name of a national hero for Judaism, so... A lot of people named Joshua. Um, Jesus, though, of Nazareth was a specific human being that we know definitely existed, definitely was a, a focal point for uh, all sorts of debate and all of that, and started Christianity as we know it. And so the question is, was he right? Did he tell the truth? That's the big question. And... A lot of people come to the conclusion, well, I, I like the guy, I think he was maybe a good teacher. I like a lot of what he has to say, but but him being God is, is too far-fetched for me to believe. A lot of people have that position. Understandable. Fair enough. But is it consistent? If he is a good teacher, and you say, I'll follow his teachings, he's a good teacher, I like the guy. And yet half the time he's going around saying, I am God, literally God. If you're saying that that's not true, then he's lying. If he's lying half the time, is he a good teacher? He wouldn't be. I, I don't think that that would be a consistent view. I don't think you could uh, come to that conclusion and say this is a good teacher. Um, and so then the other question is, well, maybe he doesn't know he was lying. Maybe he was utterly convinced that he was and he was just plain wrong. Okay, that's that's a lunatic. That's a definition of a lunatic. Um, well, then why did all these people follow him and they were willing to die for him, risk their lives willing to die for him, if he was a lunatic? Does this make sense? That doesn't follow. Or was he actually who he said he claimed to be? Which is my position. It's the only one that makes sense. Either he's a liar, a lunatic, or lord, he certainly was not um, a good teacher, because if he's just a good teacher, like good teacher only, if that's all he was, then he was a liar and, and that can't be true can't be just a good teacher. Palu, I, I, oh, I'm, I'm glad that you guys enjoy it. I, I find it fascinating, so I just get excited and I get talking. Um, I hope it's not off-putting, and I do hope, I'll be honest, I do hope that this does give people reason to go and consider for themselves what they believe. I don't think me trying to convince you, uh, strong arm you into my beliefs is going to do you much good if it's just because um, I, I won a debate, I, I, I won an intellectual argument for a spiritual subject. 
this is something that you would need to decide for yourself. This is something that you would need to look into for yourself. I can't force you to do that, but I do encourage people to honestly look at it. Take it, you know, don't don't take the derisive device, you know, the looking down your nose because, oh, it's an ancient document with, you know, the telephone game, all those things. When we pull all that aside, we find out, you know what? Those are excuses so that people don't have to take a close look. Once we take a close look, now the actual decision making comes up, and that's what people might be uncomfortable with. And so I ask that, you know, you guys just take a close look. But I'm not going to force you on anything. And if it feels like I am, just, just then I apologize. It's not my intent. I'm not trying to uh, force anyone's position that they're not comfortable with it. Shields up. Thank you. That's why it's there, because I get so distracted. I don't know if the boats are actually doing me any good. It looks like some are doing decent. The, the Phoenix are not, because there's there's way too much uh, chaff going on there. I think that most people have a problem with, with not as the accuracy or the influence of the telephone game of the Old New Testament, but rather the origin of the stories written within it. Oh, sure. So so the question is whether or not God, God is the author, right? Is it just a human writing a, a story down? Um, or is it really what happened? Right? So, so in fact, I'm, since I'm scrolling up, let me highlight that again, because you guys might not know what I'm talking about. Here you go. So, so people, I think a lot of people, they do have a problem with the second part, but they use the excuse of the first part. So the first part is, I don't think it's accurate. I don't think it's it can be believed because the telephone game, because too much time has passed. And we just showed that that's not true. But that's an easier way to describe what does make them uncomfortable. Because the second part is the origin of the story is basically the idea being, is this God inspiring the human authors to write, to write this as God's word? Or is it just a story? That is a spiritual choice. What we can say is it's accurately transmitted, but your, your conclusion on that discussion, on that question, is a spiritual one. And people are not going to be comfortable with that. Right? Like, that's, that is outside of the comfort zone. And so, because of that, I think people look to a easier way to end the discussion before it starts, and that's, well, I just think it's inaccurate. So we just, we just took that excuse away. Now we're faced with the question, do I believe what it says? And, and that's a much tougher question. Okay, so I'm skipping a little bit. So the origin of the Old Testament is not what the authors were witnesses. It's much were, some weren't. So give me a second. Give me a second to, to, to do a better job of answering that. Oh, did not spend 400. This could be disastrous. So, for example, uh, the Old Testament in, in Genesis records the creation of all things. The creation of not just the man, but of Earth, of the universe, of all of these things. Now, a lot of people are going to disagree on whether or not that really happened. Fair enough. That's another debate. Um, but what is claimed as well is that Moses was the author of Genesis. In fact, he's he's to be the author of the first five books of the Bible, called the Pentateuch. Penta meaning five. And so. Some people say, well, I don't think Moses, you know, he's just a Hebrew slave, I don't, you know, Hebrew guy, I don't think they even knew how to write, read or write. Well, we actually have found libraries from his day and age, and the guy was raised in a um, Egyptian pharaoh's household. He would have been educated, and we know that they had writing, we found whole libraries, so that's not a question on whether or not he could, but he is writing from God telling him what happened. He is writing down the creation of the world. He was not there. So Moses writes something that only God was witness to. People question that. They want to attack Moses' ability to accurately do that. Well, the Bible doesn't question it. I don't question it, but many do. Um, but Moses was not an eyewitness. However, fast forward to the very next set of books. After the first five, you get to Joshua, to Judges, and things like that. And you end up with eyewitnesses to those events. Joshua, you know, he writes his book. Samuel writes the book of Judges, and it continues on. And so those are eyewitnesses to those events. But there are some that basically... God is like, look, I was there. God's saying I was there. Here's what happened. 
And so there you go. For Moses, Moses was about, um, I want to say 1450, off the top of my, top of my head, BC. Yeah, so, so God tells God tells Moses, who is significantly after the fact, I mean, you have the empires of Egypt and all these other ancient things going on. But like, that's certainly happening. Um, I apologize. I need to figure out what I'm doing here because this is getting to be danger zone. Um... So yeah, so see, he writes it much later, but it's basically God's telling him what to write. The man's a prophet, so he's used to conversing with God about these sorts of things all the time. Again, you might not believe it, but that's that's the position of the Bible: is that this is what um, this is this is what God told Moses was going on. I think that's it. So that's basically long story short, and I, I understand it is a long story. I tend to be long-winded. Um, long story short, this is why I stream is to give somebody out there an opportunity to ask that question that they've always wanted to ask, because you might not have another outlet. So even if even if you might ultimately not agree with me, at least you had a chance to discuss it, which otherwise you might not have had that chance. I'll, the other thing I, I'm here for, and this is something I haven't mentioned today, but I like to mention as often as I as I remember to say it, is that uh, as a pastor, I, I want to be able to pray for people, and so you can you can reach out in Discord. I've got my email uh, on the on the about section, or just message in. in the, you don't need to tell me specifics, but I, I would love to be available, just to be offering like to just to pray for people. You can just say, hey, I'm I'm going through something. Um, be more than happy to do that. Again, sometimes we just don't have access to somebody uh, that can that can help us through something, even just to listen. And and I'd like to be available for that too if I can. Now you guys had a lot of good questions there. I apologize if I skipped over some. It was not my intent. Feel free to ask it again if I if I did in fact miss your question. Or, or, or I didn't sufficiently answer a question because I got excited and moved on to something. That's just that's just my personality. Um, it's not my intent to ignore people. I, I want to answer every question I can. 